today we have the Real Estate Inland Port Panel. We're super excited to have them and it will be moderated by Ryan Whitby. He is the associate, an associate professor of economics and finance here at the Huntsman School of Business. Um, and afterwards, we will have time for question and answers. Um, so be, be thinking of some that you'd like to ask. So Ryan. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you again for being here. We're really excited. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, we really appreciate your time and efforts to make it up here. Uh, it's really invaluable. So um, format generally, we're going to let them do introductions. They're going to tell us who they are, what they're doing a little bit. Then we're going to get into the projects they're working on, some of the details, uh, and then we'll just have some questions. We'll talk a little bit, have a conversation, and then at the end, it'll be your turn to chime in and ask some questions and follow up uh, with what you think is interesting. So I'm just going to turn the time over to them. My goal is to talk as little as possible. So if you see me talking too much, right, wave me down. I'll stop. Uh, we want to hear from these guys, and we really appreciate it. So let's actually let's start with a round of applause for them for coming, because I really appreciate their effort. <laughs> Great. So why don't we just uh, start with you, Travis, and uh, we'll work our way this direction. So my name is Travis Lish. I, I run a company called Stokes Capital Partners. It's headquartered in Cache Valley. I live and work in Salt Lake. Uh, I graduated from the Huntsman School of Business a long time ago. Um, started in, in, in this business actually as a result of, of an opportunity very similar to this where I was in school in a class, a real estate finance class being taught by Dr. Alan Stevens and he had two guests come in, Deloy Hansen and Paul Willie, who talked about the acquisition of the American Stores building which is the Wells Fargo building in downtown Salt Lake City and after that class I decided I no longer wanted to go to dental school, I wanted to uh, work in real estate um, and I spent a decade with Woodbury Corporation as a senior project manager and part of their executive development team. And for the last four years, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, Lance, Brian, Jeff, the, the folks that you see up here, and just happy to be here. Spent a lot of time in Cache Valley. This is kind of home for me, so glad to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Brian Stevenson. Can you hear me okay? I actually grew up here in, in the valley in Providence, went to Mountain Crest High School and then came to Utah State after that and graduated here in the business school in 2007. Um, after that, I went to work for a development group. Once I decided I wanted to be in real estate, I moved to, to Salt Lake City and worked for the Woodbury Corporation for about a year and a half doing development and acquisitions and then went to graduate school to go study, go study state specifically. Went to Columbia, did the MRED program in New York and from there, I worked in a, a private equity shop for about a year and a half. I was still a little undecided if I wanted to do private equity or real estate. And I decided that real estate's really what I wanted to do. And so after that, I, I broke off and decided to go out on my own. And I started working closely with, with Lance and his group and the Colmena group. And since then, we've, we've built and acquired about every asset class in real estate. We do a lot of industrial. We do multifamily, we do residential and hotel. And uh, love what I'm doing. Look forward to going to work every day and work with really good partners. These guys are partners on a lot of different projects that we work on together. So that's me. Uh, my name is Lance Bullen and I'm sorry to say I didn't go to Utah State, but I am from Logan. So I have a, a little <laughs> bit of cred. I went to the U, which is probably better than going to BYU. But um, <laughs> I do enjoy the spirit up here, the vibe up here. It's really, really cool and refreshing to come up to a place where there's so much talent, a lot of really young, good, positive energy, excited to go into the business world, which is kind of what needs to happen in the real estate industry. Is There's a lot of opportunity in the real estate industry. Uh, technology is changing the way real estate works. And so it's really cool to see a lot of interest in, in the space. Um, I ended up working at Woodbury Corporation as well. We actually kind of all, Travis needed help to do his job basically. So we- They were all my interns at Woodbury. <laughs> so we all, we all worked with Travis uh, and then kind of took separate paths. I, I started a company called Colmenic Group. And as Brian explained, we do all different types of real estate investments and development work. And we built up a portfolio of probably about a billion dollars of assets that we manage today. And one of the exciting projects we're working on is the Inland Port area project in Salt Lake City. And so um, that's been kind of a, a big history of us. And like, for the past two years, it's been something that I've been spending a lot of time on. So we'll hopefully get to talk more about it. 
My name is Jeff Nielsen. I uh, I don't work for the Woodbury Company, so that's something I don't have in common. Jeff with wasn't you guys. my intern. No, I was not. I was not Travis's intern. I was not that lucky, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I, I'm here, I'm from the Valley here. I went to Logan High School, graduated, and uh, decided to go to BYU. So I went down to BYU, and then I got really wise. You can boo. And uh, you can boo if you want, yeah. No, but I got wise, and after about a year at BYU, I transferred back to Utah State. Uh, I, I enrolled in the uh, Hutzman School of Business and had a, got a degree in accounting. Um, decided that I wanted to go into public accounting. That's what I thought my route was going to be. And so my, after my junior year, I interviewed for an internship with KPMG, one of the big four accounting firms in Los Angeles, and uh, did an internship for four months and decided after that four months that there was no way I wanted to go into public accounting. Uh, luckily at the time, I was, uh, while I was in school, I was working part-time for the Wasatch Group, which is going back to Deloitte Hanson, which was started by Deloitte Hanson back in the 1980s. I was doing accounting um, for the Wasatch Group and also managing some HOAs. Um, and so during that process, uh, I got more familiar with real estate and kind of more engaged in Wasatch. And during my senior year, I was deciding whether to take an offer with KPMG or to do something else. And I was really looking for anything else other than, uh, other than public accounting. Not to deter any of you from public accounting, because it is great. I just, it wasn't for me. And at the time, Wasatch was starting a development company. This was back in 2004. And so I joined with that company to do accounting. And so I actually left school a semester early. I had two classes left, which I completed online. Um, my wife claims that she helped me complete those classes. They were some, some, uh, some kind of general classes that I didn't finish at BYU that I ended up taking here, like an English 101 or 1010 class and a few things like that. So um, started with that company. And that company really has been focused on multifamily development. We focus both on affordable housing as well as market rate housing. A lot of our work has been in Southern California, the Bay Area of California and then the Sacramento, kind of East Bay area. Uh, and then we do a lot of work here in, in Utah. So excited to be here with you today. Great. Uh, we will jump right into the discussion of the Inland Port and some of the projects they're working on. So we have got a quick video clip that we will play, and then uh, we'll go from there.
Okay, so yep, jump right um, in. <laughs> I'll do my best to explain the concept of an inland port by asking you guys a few questions. How many of you have ever ordered something online? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you think you're going to order more online in the future than you do today? Okay, so the average online sales as a percentage of total sales in the country is around you know, 12 or 13 uh, percent today. But everyone thinks that that's going to climb. It could be 30 percent, 40 percent. No one really knows how many, you know, how much as a percentage of sales will grow. But as that increase grows, what happens is a lot more stuff needs to get to a lot more places in a, in a much quicker time frame. And so as that trend continues to build, how many of you see Amazon trucks come to your house on a daily basis or on a weekly basis? As that volume increases, the need to manage all that inventory and the logistics behind that is a pretty complex thing. And so Salt Lake City happens to be one of the most strategic locations in the West with respect to connectivity to infrastructure. And so, you know, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the best sites for commerce were located next to freeways because that's where all the eyeballs were. That's where people were driving and they would see a store, they would see the mall and they would pull over and go shopping. How many of you have been to the mall in the last month? Raise your hand. Okay, so being next to a, a freeway where people want to drive to is less valuable today. And what's valuable today is being next to rail uh, freeways for where trucks go, airports, the connectivity to logistics is really the new kind of oceanfront property, if you will, for this kind of emerging trend that's happening. And what's even more fascinating is Salt Lake, we're one of the most strategically located locations from a rail perspective in the country, but less than 10% of everything we buy at the store comes to us by rail. So nine out of 10 products you buy got to you exclusively by truck, whether it came from California, California, came from Chicago, wherever it came from, from the Gulf of Mexico, it was driven to you all the way to your front door. And that's not really, in the end, if you think about it, that's not the most efficient way to do things because, well, trucks create congestion, you know, we can't grow with an endless kind of truck served model. And so if you look at the growth uh, pattern for our region and the country, and if you think about how many more people want to move to this part of the country and all the commerce that flows through this part of the country, we really need to enhance rail and make rail a bigger solution to the logistics supply chain. So that kind of in a nutshell is what an inland port is all about. It's saying, can we do something more efficiently? Can we move products in volume faster, and can we do it in, in a cheaper way, not a cheaper way, but in a lower cost alternative in a place like Salt Lake City versus Los Angeles or versus Oakland or versus you know Seattle, where you're really in, the, in a much higher rent district. And so we're really excited to be kind of in the very beginning stages of what we think is going to be kind of a transformational opportunity for the state and for the region at large. It's not just a single project, it's more of a concept or an idea about how we're going to see a lot more uh, of this logistics supply chain inventory management process kind of prolifer proliferate out through the country. And one of the reasons why that happens is to be an online retailer, if you're going to order a pair of shoes, they don't know where you are, but they know that they need to have a pair of shoes close to where you are so that you get them in less than two days. So it just requires a lot more inventory and a lot more locations to be able to kind of predictively give you what you want if you're going to order something on Amazon or, or online. So that's kind of the concept of what an inland port is. And we're super excited about it. And it's um, one of the trends in real estate, among other trends, that's probably one of the biggest transformational trends. If you, if you go to the mall and you see all the vacant spaces and you count up those stores that have gone dark, the square footage of that store is now in, an, in, 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 in a kind of a warehouse somewhere. It's just being transferred to a warehouse. It doesn't mean that they're not continuing to do sales. That's just being transferred into a warehouse. And so that's, that's really what's going on in, in, the, in the real estate world on the industrial side, which is why we're really excited to be involved in it and really kind of predict it to be uh, something that can grow and, and be something that we want to spend a lot of time working on. Great. 
Uh, other thoughts, Inland Port, how, what, what are your activities with it? What role are you playing in the development of it? So this? you've probably heard or seen in the news, there's been a lot of talk, even controversy around this Inland Port. What is it? Why is it happening? And there's been uh, kind of a, a fight between the city of Salt Lake and the state of Utah on who gets to control this Inland Port. But for us, as developers, as you saw up here, so we went and we bought... 1,500 acres of land. Now this is west of, of the Salt Lake Airport and north of I-80. The new state prison is being built in this area, if you're familiar where that is. So that's in the back corner of the site. So as part of that, we bought the 1,500 acres and then Rio Tinto, the big mining company, they own the other 1,500 acres next to us. And so the idea is we've got two landowners that control 3,000 contiguous acres next to the Salt Lake City Airport, and also next to I-80, and I-80 being the main thoroughfare that goes all the way from San Francisco to New York City across the entire country. And then you've got I-15 that runs north and south. So when they from say- Canada to Mexico. Canada to Mexico. So when they say the, the crossroads of the West, it literally is the crossroads of the West. That's how goods and transport happens throughout the United States. So we as developers say, hey, we're in the warehouse business. We want to build and rent warehouses to companies that are moving goods in and out of the country. And Salt Lake is very uniquely positioned really in the country for that because of that crossroads effect. And then as you saw the rail map, we are in a, a triangle basically between the Seattle deep port, the Oakland port and the Long Beach port. And between those three ports, that's where the majority of all goods are shipped from overseas through the United States and it all comes through Salt Lake City. And so that's where we're positioning ourselves to provide warehouse and rail and storage for all those companies that are moving goods in and out. But I think just kind of to understand a little bit of what it, what it meant for us and, and what we did on the front end, that 1,500 acres that we acquired, we acquired that from a family that had owned the ground for over 100 years. So you really had one landowner that had owned the ground forever. It had been farmed, it was ranch property. Um, with cattle grazing on it, you know, so it didn't have any entitlement, meaning that you couldn't go out at that point at any point in time during when they owned it and put anything on it. One, it lacked infrastructure, but two, it didn't have any entitlements. So our group, uh, you know, we went and we worked with Salt Lake City to go and, and get the ground entitled. So uh, we took this raw agricultural ground and got it zoned to M1, which allows for uh, the various industrial high bay type uses that, that Lance and Brian talked about and really created that value. And then in conjunction with that, we work closely with the state of Utah, with DFCM, the Division of Facilities and Construction Management, to enhance the infrastructure that they were putting in place for the prison, the water, the sewer, the power, the roads, and everything that they were doing to put in all that backbone infrastructure so that that entire 3,000, well, I guess when you add the other landowner, 3,800 acres, could all be put in service and, and have buildings and, and other types of uses put on it. So from our side on the front end, you see the video and all of the nice stuff. That was, you know, 12 months of work with, with a city that is notoriously difficult, um, you know, to, to get ground entitled with, but that we had a reputation um, and a track record of going in and be able, being able to work uh, in cooperation with the cities, with the, the NGOs, um, and all the different environmental groups associated with that to find a, a comprehensive solution that, that everybody could be really happy with. So how long did it take, the entitlement process? So we had the property under contract for about a year, and we started during that period under contract. And, and full entitlements happened in January. We closed in November. So we had a year and maybe like three months to get the whole project entitled to to a, to a classification where we can build what we want to build on the property. And, you know, that, that, that process is always about, you know, it's a, it's a public engaged process. You're talking to the public, you're trying to make sure that, you know, we're sensitive to things that they care about. At the same time, you're also saying, well, you know, in the best interest of the, of, of the property, what is its highest and best use? What does it really want to be? And, you know, we, we've, we've taken very seriously that whole idea of, you know, we want, we want Utah to be this great place to live in, and we, we, we're careful, we, we wanna make sure that 
you know, our kids can be just as excited about living here as we are because we're from the community. We, we, we're not speaking on behalf of the, of the state or anything like that, but at the end of the day, we want to be proud of this area. And, and we really think, that's why we think rail is such a, a key opportunity to, of growth because one train will take 200 trucks off the road. That's kind of the ratio. And the fact that we only ship, you know, 10% or less of everything to this market by rail is just kind of a crazy thing. It's just crazy because of our infrastructure is so, is so much uh, better from, re from a rail standpoint. So the more rail that comes here, the less emissions that uh, there will be, the better the air quality will be as we grow as a community. And so that's why we're, we're, we actually think the Inland Port is a great idea for quality of life, even though, you know, there's people who have differing opinions on that. We think that the quality of life is going to be much better with a facility that's really planned out and, and well thought of that could really change for, you know, 50 years how the supply chain works in this part of the country. Next steps. What happens next? Well, we need to break ground. Uh, we actually have started initial site work on a couple buildings. Um, Talk a little bit about the size of the buildings just to kind of... Yeah, so context. that's a really, you know, the average building size. How many of you have seen an Amazon warehouse up close? Or how many of you had a chance to look at a UPS facility? So the average building size has, has steadily grown in our market to a point now where you're seeing a 400,000 foot building is pretty commonplace. And even a million square feet, you know, building in, in really mature markets like in Texas or even in California, you're seeing million square foot buildings all over the place, which is a really big building if you think about that. But it's give us an idea scale wise. What I mean, what what's that comparable? To? So you'll you'll need probably about 45 acres of land for one building in in order to build that building to park that building. But at the end of the day, it's all about the consumption and the production that every one of us are a part of. You know, every, everything you've ever purchased, whether at a grocery store, there's a, there's a Post Foods uh, facility that's a million square feet. So all the Lucky Charms you've ever eaten, ever eaten will, will now go through that facility or any box of cereal. I mean, if you think of a million feet of cereal, that's a lot of cereal boxes. <laughs> but that's, that's, how the, that's how efficient the market is getting. It's, it's getting that efficient to be able to deliver stuff you know, it's, it's fascinating. If you click on an item, it can be at your house the same day. And, you know, Salt Lake just turned on same-day delivery. You know, it's a, you, you order something in the morning and it's your front door in, in the afternoon. That's because they need million square foot facilities to be able to accommodate, you know, all the inventory management. Um, we toured the Amazon facility that was just built west of the airport. It's a million square feet floor area, but it's actually 2.5 million square feet because there's mezzanine levels inside that space. And half of the building is dedicated to robotics without even people working in that side. And it's going, those robotics are going out and, buy, and finding whatever order item someone ordered and bringing it back to the shipping uh, and boxing station. And so the buildings are getting really big and really efficient, but they're very technical. The, you know, the, the engineering behind the buildings, the, the way that they, you know, how high you can stack materials, how much weight the floor can support. It's, it's a very technologically advanced process to, to be able to have a building like that. And it's really a lot of the future. And I think that's a big part of the wisdom of the state we don't really just want to be a consumption market. You know, we don't really just want to just consume things that come from China and that's it. That's really not the, the core differentiator of Utah. What we really need to do is we, we, we need to produce goods, make things and send them from Salt Lake to other markets. And so the logistics is, you know, we, we, we order a lot more overseas than we produce because we have a, a, a deficit in trade. Everyone knows that. But I think Utah is really trying to say, how can we flip that in reverse? How can we use that outbound traffic back to the ports and back to other markets? How can we leverage that to the advantage of Utah? And whether you're, you're interested in real estate or, or, or uh, you know, in, into any type of company that's gonna be processing, making goods, or, or in the supply chain, you're gonna be a participant in that, in that area. And I think Utah is a really exciting location for that to occur because the amount of infrastructure that's being invested in just this small area of the city, there's almost $5 billion of infrastructure investment with the prison, with the airport, with the roads, with the rail facility. And that's gonna create a really cool ecosystem for production. 
Uh, challenges? What's the what challenges are on the horizon? There's I mentioned it earlier. There's real estate of all the other asset classes that you can work in or businesses you work in. It's very political because you have to go in and get approvals from a body of of government. And so we did that with the initial approval. But even after that has all been approved and zoned and entitled, there's still differing opinions amongst the legislature and who wants to own this idea. It's funny because once you get it to a certain critical mass, now they want to put their name on it and they want to take credit for it. And then especially they want to collect the taxes that are produced from it. And so that's the internal battle between the city of Salt Lake and the state of Utah. And because we own the land, we're, we're in the middle and we have to play both sides and make sure that we are viewed favorably by both sides. I would say that's our biggest challenge right now. The real estate speaks for itself, honestly. And in, in case it wasn't clear, this enables, if you're, just look at cash value, if you're Maloof or an Icon or any of these importers that are based here, this enables you to take a container of goods that are shipped directly from Shanghai or whatever port you're using overseas. And rather than dropping that box in Long Beach and then taking that to your warehouse in Long Beach where you're paying California wages, California rent, California labor, all those things, that container goes directly onto a train and it's still sealed up, hasn't broke customs yet. That comes directly to Salt Lake City and that's where they crack the container for the first time. It clears customs in Salt Lake City and then it goes to your warehouse where you're paying about a third or maybe even a half of what you'd be paying in those markets. So the, the cost of a good that you buy is just a sum of all the parts it takes to get to you, the cost of materials and the supply chain. So if you can reduce that cost, eventually you reduce the cost of the final product. Any other thoughts, Travis? So when, when Brian and Lance talk about real estate and challenges, the, the real estate part of it, you know, and, and going out and, and creating plans and designing the building and doing the engineering behind the building, going out to bid with the various different contractors where we're in that stage right now and we'll select the contractor to build those, those first two buildings, that part of it is, is really pretty basic and easy and, and that's something that you know, is, is, is readily available and, and, and can be done by all of us. The part that's you know, been the huge challenge, as, they've, as they have mentioned, is really the, the political aspect of it. Um, to be really good in this field and in this industry, you have to be totally dialed in in your ability to go in and work with the municipality, to work with a county, whether that's a city, a county, or state government. And in this project, we got the trifecta. We have the city that wants it done a certain way, the county that wants it done a certain way, and the state of Utah that wants it done a certain way. And we're the group in the middle that's part of that tug of war and trying to help find compromising solutions and help everybody collaborate and work together and understand the wins. And so you can say, well, what does that have to do with real estate? And really the answer is nothing other than you've got to be really good at being able to get people to, to buy into your idea. Um, and so, so the challenge is it's, it's not just analytics and, and being able to, to go find a piece of dirt and do a design in a strategic location. You've got to be able to encompass that into one comprehensive solution and in, in being able to work together with a, a lot of different um, governmental agencies that, that probably view things a lot differently than you do. Great. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit now. Uh, we'll let Jeff do some talking and tell us about something he's working on. Great. Do you want to keep that? You can keep this on. I'm going to actually stand up so I can use the point. Did you have a pointer? I can just kind of point and walk through this real quick. Somewhere. Unfortunately, I don't have a nice video as, as these guys do, so we'll have to go off this. The red button right here. Okay. This is a project we're working on in Midvale, Utah. Midvale is kind of in the center of the Salt Lake Valley. Um, it's 260 acres. It's right off of, it's kind of hard to see here, but I don't know, does that pointer even work? I don't think it works, actually. But, um, oh, maybe it did. No, no, you got the mouse, actually. So I-15, if you look at the top of the screen, that would be I-15. Just to the north of the screen is 7200, or excuse me, on, on the left side of the screen is, uh, is 7200 South. And then on the bottom of the screen here would be 90 South. So if you guys kind of have an idea of Salt Lake. So it kind of sits right in the middle of Salt Lake Valley. As I mentioned, this site is 260 acres. The only reason you have 260 acres available in the middle of Salt Lake is there's something wrong with it. This site um, is a former EPA Superfund site. 
there was a steel production facility that sat, if you can see where it says 240 units, right there, there was a, a steel facility that sat there. Uh, and they produced steel for a number of years, contaminated the soil. The EPA came in 20, 30 years ago, designated as a Superfund site, and then finished their remediation about 10 years ago. The problem is the way they remediated it, they remediated it such that it probably worked as a golf course, and that's about it. So the land sat for about 10 years with a group that owned it and really decided, hey, there's nothing we can build here. We partnered with a group called the Gardner Company. You may be familiar with them. They're a real estate developer in Salt Lake. Um, I guess I should explain, just to the north is also another super fun site. It's roughly 200 acres. We developed that property in conjunction with the Gardner Company. That has a couple million square feet of, of office. Uh, eBay, has, or not, excuse me, not eBay, Overstock. If you guys have probably seen Overstock, right? They have their big headquarters there. It's a big circle building. Actually, if you go to Google Earth, it's kind of cool to see. It's a big, it's literally an O, the building. Um, but we developed that site, and, and then we came to this site with them um, and tried to figure out if we could build anything on it. So we did a number of, of geophysic testing over several years to see what the settlement was. What we determined was after a couple years of looking at this, we thought the settlement was a lot less than we had anticipated. So we, de we determined that we could build on it, essentially. And so what we have on this site plan, um, and, and the mouse isn't working, but if you kind of look in, or is it working? Or the pointer? Maybe I just can't see. Oh, yeah, it is working there. OK. So uh, up in this area right here, this is 800 multifamily units, apartment units. Most of you probably live in apartments, right? Well, so I guess a lot of you are high school students. You probably live with mom and dad. But um, you will live in apartments. <laughs> Hopefully all of you live in apartments. For our business to continue, please move into apartments. <laughs> uh, someday you can buy a home. Just don't do it soon. Um, but anyways, so this is 800 multifamily units right here. It's a combination of of stacked flats, like you know, buildings, three and four story buildings, as well as townhome buildings. Um, in this area, you have a couple million square feet of office, plus you have a couple hotel pads. And then right here, we have a limited amount of retail. And the reason we have a limited amount of retail is because guys like this. No, I'm just kidding, no, it's not really their fault. But really, as we've talked about, everything's kind of gone to online shopping, right? So most of your retailers are kind of going away. The most of the retail that you see now in developments like this is really food oriented. So right here, this will be, I would guess, probably 100% food, maybe a few services like massage, haircut, nails, things like that. But that's most of what retail you see being developed today. The big box stores, the Kmarts, the Walmarts, you don't see as many of those going on as you used to. I think you know, the world's kind of trending more to, to online shopping. So we have limited retail on the site. Um, right here, uh, this was originally planned as a hotel. We're now um, in the process of designing a, a Real Salt Lake. I don't know if you have any soccer fans. Uh, it's a, an academy for their U13 and U15 team. So kids that are like 12 to 15 years old will, um, will be training right here. We'll have an indoor facility, uh, very similar. There's actually a facility in North Logan, an indoor facility over by um, Ridgeline High School. I don't know if any of you go to Ridgeline, not Ridgeline, uh, Green Canyon, excuse me, Green Canyon. They weren't here. There was only three high schools back in the day, Green Canyon. Right across the street, there's an indoor facility. And uh, a, a facility very similar to that will sit here. And then there'll be an outdoor field for uh, practicing in, in the warmer months. Um, on this end, uh, we're in the process right now of re-entitling this entire area and adding about 1,000 units of density. Um, we're anticipating growth in multifamily over time. This is kind of our long-term play. And so whereas this area here is, is surface park, meaning you're just parking on asphalt, there's no parking structures, this area is designed to be more based around parking structures. So these buildings here actually have parking structures sitting underneath them. And these buildings, uh, these are called podium in our world. And then these are called wrap buildings. And you can see the parking structures here in the middle. And the building essentially wraps around the parking structure. Um, uh, in addition to this, uh, one of the things we, so in negotiating with cities, typically it's kind of a give and take relationship. They want, if you want something from them, they typically want something back. And so for us asking for additional density, additional thousand units of density, they ask that we come in and do a 20 acre park through the middle of the site. And so uh, we've designed this park, as you can see the green going, I can't follow this very well, I can't see it from my angle, but you can see the park here. Um, that's being designed. And so we've kind of traded 20 acres of park 
and about $4 million of improvement costs in that park in exchange for the additional density on the site. So we're excited about this site. We have a number of projects going on in, in Salt Lake right now. This is just one that we're working on and, and pretty excited about it. Fantastic. Uh, how long from, I mean, it's stages you're talking about. What's the timeline for a project like this? Um, the timeline for a project like this is probably 10 to 15 years, to be honest with you. We started working on it about four years ago. Um, up in that top right corner is our first phase. It's under construction right now. It's 374 units. Um, and it is the first development on the site. The office hasn't begun. So probably 10 to 15 years, potentially longer, depending on what happens with the economy. Yeah, much longer horizons in real estate with some of these projects. Um, let's talk a little bit about the future of real estate. We've talked about the changing landscape of retail. Uh, what do you see on the horizon for real estate? What's, um, what will things look like 10 years from now in terms of being a developer, in terms of uh, just the real estate markets? I don't, think, I don't think anyone knows exactly what that answer would be, to say it correctly, but if just kind of trying to predict the future, I think in our region of the country, we're running out of kind of vast tracts of land in the, in the cities in which we live, especially here in the Wasatch Front. And it's, it's definitely putting pressure, uh, and it's really helping people like Jeff uh, create more of a, den more of a density-based model for housing. And I, I would argue that that's probably going to become much more the norm. You know, you're seeing a lot more people choose to live in urban environments, maybe not buying a home in their 20s like, you know, I did. Maybe that's, you know, a decision that's pushed off a little further. And keeping their options open and but living in, in more of an urban setting and, and being okay with a little bit more of a density-based model because we just don't have the ability to continue to build single family tracks of, you know, of neighborhoods for a long time coming. Uh, obviously the trends in real estate with online sales, I think are just gonna continue. I think you're gonna see a lot less uh, retail uh, and, and I think you're gonna see a lot more, uh, you know, kind of warehouse industrial solutions. Um, but a lot more products and services are gonna find you and be delivered to you rather than you going out and trying to, hey, I'm hungry, I'm gonna go find this, or I'm looking for shoes, I'm gonna go out and look for those. Th those things are gonna find you. And that's gonna be a lot more based on, you know, products coming your way. So I think infrastructure to bring stuff to you is a big part of the real estate world too, coming, you know, going on to the future. I would take a little different, I think all that's correct, but on the other side, if you look at like the capital market side of real estate, it's, it's so much different than it was 10 years ago, and I see 10 years from now being it's so much different than it is today. The typical kind of private equity and public equities markets have been established for a long time, but real estate is really starting to come into its own at this point. If you go to any of the big investment banks or you know, the Goldman Sachs, they're now allocating much more of their capital into real estate and real estate type investing. And with that, you get greater transparency into the market, there's more debt and equity financing available. So I think as an asset class, it's going to continue to get more institutionalized. And because of that, it's going to create more, many more jobs within the real estate industry, but aren't really working on the, the brick and mortar development side of real estate. I'm seeing a lot of investment banker type saying, hey, I want to get into real estate now. I'm kind of tired of doing the public equities and bonds trade, I want to be in an alternative asset class, which would be real estate. And there's the infrastructure behind that that's starting to get built up. Let me follow up on that. That So the big institutions lower the cost, things get cheaper in terms of the financing. Does that come at a cost? I mean, you're now dealing with bigger players that maybe have different expectations and different, and different ideas of what uh, you should be doing. Does Absolutely. I mean, for example, we we sold a portfolio of industrial assets this summer to Fortress Group. You've probably heard the name. Fortress is a group out of New York City that really has never been to Salt Lake before. But for some reason, they're saying, hey, we want to be in Salt Lake. We see it as a growth market, and we ended up selling them six buildings. And so you have increased competition. Absolutely. You can ask Jeff. He's developing apartments downtown. He's now competing against national firms rather than the typical handful of local development firms that we're used to competing against. 
it. Yeah, I, I mean, just to add to that, I think as you see bigger firms come to, to our market, it, it lowers investors' returns, unfortunately. They, they play with a little bit different capital than, than groups like ours do. And so returns of, say, we're expecting double-digit cash-on-cash type returns. So if I invest a dollar, I expect to get you know, 10 to 15 cents back. That's probably more like five cents now. I think it's something kind of to parlay on, on what um, Brian was saying, that a trend that we're seeing, something that I think will change the landscape over the, or the next 10 years, is really commercial real estate has benefited from declining interest rates over the last 30 years. And, and you guys may not be as familiar with this, but as interest rates go down, commercial real estate values go up, right? They kind of work inversely. And so there's been a lot of value creation or equity creation in real estate over the last 30, 30 years as interest rates have somewhat consistently declined. You know, several kind of think maybe we've hit kind of a bottom of interest rates and we're going to start see a reverse of that trend and interest rates are going to start going up, which is going to have some impact on real estate from an equity standpoint, but it's going to improve the cash flow. So that may change some of the, the, the mindset of institutional investors when it's less of an equity value creation play and more of a cash flow on making a monthly check type play. And so um, that'll be interesting to see over the next you know, 10 years or so. So I would, I would add to that, like as Jeff was mentioning and Brian were mentioning, you're seeing a compression of cap rates. So, so the returns on the projects that we're working on, when you're competing against a firm that's willing to take a lower, a lower they have a lower yield, a lower threshold, uh, that's going to really drive competition. Also, over the next 10 years, I think what you're going to see um, is, is the federal government enacted legislation called Opportunity Zone legislation that's, that's basically, uh, in a nutshell, it's tax advantage real estate, where as part of the Invest in America Act that was passed you know, shortly before uh, December of 2017, what they offered in that was an ability to you know, have investors that incurred a, a, a capital gain from the sale of of a stock from the sale of a company or from the sale of real estate and to take that gain and invest it in a, into a qualified opportunity zone fund and, and really get a couple of different benefits from that. And one of those is that you get to defer your tax until on or before uh, December 31st, 2026. Two, for doing that, if, you, if you're in there for the full seven years, you get a discount, you get a step up in basis. So a 15% discount on the tax that was owed when that's now paid down the road on that tax deferral. And then the big benefit from it is if you have it, if you allow your gain to remain in that qualified opportunity zone fund for uh, at least 10 years at your exit at disposition, you get a full step up in basis. So if you had a million dollar gain and you in invested that million dollars into the opportunity zone fund and at disposition, it's now a $3 million it, back to you in value, you get a full step up in basis from one million to three million and you don't pay any additional tax. The reason the federal government did that is they went out in a, in a joint tax commission survey and study and they identified with the economic innovation group which is a joint task force of some of the best and brightest from Silicon Valley and with uh, a group of, 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 con of Congress um, and they determined that there's six and a half trillion dollars that is sitting on the sidelines in the United States that's not part of of it, it's not trading hands at all because you've got all these different companies that that you know went public and you have kids like you that invented the next Facebook that you know now have stock worth thirty million dollars and they don't want to sell that stock because the second they do you know they're going to pay fifty you know forty to fifty percent you know in a tax rate so they just hold on to it so that money's not in in the cycle and so they use this to incentivize and then to say. You only get those tax benefits if you go out and you invest in qualified opportunity zone areas, which are low income demographic census tracts. And so each state got to identify those low income demographic census tracts. So, so the catch is we want you to come in and, in, and invest and inject money and, and create jobs and turn around um, these low income demographic census tracts that never really recovered from the Great Recession or are still continuing to see that decline. And, and, and now, between now and, and the end of June, when, when that first little break that, they, that the federal government issued, when Treasury issued the regulations, you're going to just see this huge injection of capital uh, into real estate. It was really meant to kind of grow and, and help, you know, create new companies, but really the benefit of it, you know, just turned into a real estate play. And so everybody will be competing with that out there as well. 
Uh, we're running out of time, so let's uh, take some questions. Um, how do we want to do that? Go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question. Hi, so I'm uh, Talmadge Steele. What advice would you give to people that want to go into the real estate industry? Um, my advice would be just to go to a job where you're going to be challenged, where you're going to have to learn a lot of different things. And it's not always about working for the biggest, most established company you can find. Um, I found sometimes that's like a very detailed, every day you're going to fill out this little TPS report and you're going to do it for three years. And people do that because they're like, I want this on my resume. And that's not a bad idea, but I think it's almost better to say, where, where's somewhere where I can get exposed to a really wide array of stuff in the real estate market? It could be a small company. I mean, I don't think any of us really made money in our first jobs. It was really just more about learning and trying to figure out the space. And I think I look back at kind of that first three to five year window of time that I was working, making very little money, but trying to learn a lot as a really formative experience for me that kind of solidified that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. And I don't know if I would have gotten that experience if I would have said, I have to go to this giant firm and just do the same thing every day, just so people eventually will see that I have that on my resume. That's kind of my two cents. I just add to that, um, you know, re real estate's not overly complicated. You just have to, as Lance said, you kind of have to be a master of, of several aspects of business, though. And so when, when we're looking for people and we're hiring people, we want somebody that can come into our organization and hit the ground running, right? If someone has essentially no experience, no work experience in whatever field it may be that we're hiring, um, you know, it's hard for us to spend a lot of time training people because we're busy as well. And so I, I think, you know, as much experience as you can get, whether you're in high school or college, that could be applicable to, you know, adding value to whatever organization you're going to go into, I would try to gain that experience now because it's going to make you much more uh, valuable to whatever company you, you join after school. I, I would add that, you know, for me and having the background, you know, with business administration and, and economics and finance, um, that financial background and the ability to be able to, to take and, and, and create analysis. Right? Whether you're analyzing a company or you're analyzing real estate, the ability to, to be able to create in a spreadsheet that, you, that you're doing here on a daily basis in your classes, that's a huge plus. And that's something that you know, you're going to use in any industry that you go into. And that's something that I'd highly recommend is, is be able to have that background of being able to you know, create. What, it, what is the cash on cash yield? You know, how do you amortize and, and create the... the the pro forma to analyze, you know, a, a return on an asset. You know, what does the debt constant look like? What what do all of those those terminologies mean? And how do you make all those calculations? And how can you uh, compute that into a spreadsheet? We do that on a daily basis. We do that all the time. So we're using you know math and analytics um, on a daily basis. So I would highly encourage you know that um, if you're interested in real estate to have that as a as a big background as well. I don't think I have anything to add. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Samuel Barry. So what kind of annual average return do you guys look to get out of the projects that you invest in? That's what I'm wondering. So it, it really does vary by asset class, honestly, because a downtown apartment project is going to be very different than, you know, something in a tertiary market. But I would say we do have a rough framework. We want to get double-digit returns on our cash every year. And that's just like the baseline goal. We typically will underwrite an IRR over a 10-year period for the project. Whether we plan on selling it or not, we'd like to just see what it would be like if we did sell, but at least double digit returns on our cash every year, meaning not including the amortization of debt, that's the monthly or annual check that's coming out of that project back to the investment group. And obviously the higher people would say more risk you're taking. And so we like to be between that 10 and 15% return per year on our cash. 
fr from a multifamily perspective, typically we'll look, uh, from multifamily development perspective, perspective, I should say, typically we'll look at what assets are currently trading at. So if an asset is currently trading at a five or a 525 cap, we want to be about 200 basis points higher on our unlevered cap rate. So we want to be, if it's trading at a five to 525, we want to be seven to 725. And that typically will get to double digit cash on cash returns. And in fact, a little bit better, usually about 15% double digit cash on cash returns. With leverage. With leverage, exactly, when you add leverage. That's good. Any other questions? Um, hi, I was just wondering what inspired you guys to tackle this uh, opportunity to create an inland port for the Western US? <laughs> Probably just being dumb and naive and thinking we were smart enough and young enough and hungry enough to take it on yeah. really I mean it we joke all the time. It's like we're gonna grow old working on this property and I, I Don't know what it is to be honest with you I think kind of a lot of us kind of act like we have a chip on our shoulder for some reason I don't know if it's because we're all from kind of a small town and we want to prove to somebody that we can pull something off maybe that's the wrong way to say that but just being motivated to do something that's kind of cool and being on the front end of something that feels like it's the right trend. So much of our industry is kind of like a herd and everyone kind of just runs to that next thing that's the thing. And I think all of us in our own way are trying to be contrarian or trying to be like really ahead of, and not to say that we are, I mean, that's, that's I'm not saying that we, we are predicting the future here but trying to think, you know, it's really hard to think about what will happen in the future and why. And being a, being a, you know, Jeff says, I think this is a great site that's been overlooked because people have dismissed it because of its problems. And so it's, it's trying to find a mispriced bet is kind of the best way to describe it. We looked at that land and it wasn't zoned. It was agriculture for all the reasons you should never buy that type of property. It just made no Environmental sense. hazards. Environmental, there was a landfill there. We looked at it and said, there is nothing like this in the country. This much land, this close to the freeway, this close to the airport, connected to all this great you know, infrastructure in the city. So we kind of felt like that was a risk worth taking. And so... Well, the basis in the land, the cost the of cost, the land yeah. made it so that we could justify taking those risks. I think kind of financial logic, Wall Street is like the risk is priced exactly according to return. So a lot of people would say, let's wait till it's entitled and then pay four times for it because that's the right risk for that. That's the right price for that type of risk. We, we looked at it and said, let's play a fraction of its value, hoping that we can get it to be worth what it really is worth. And in this case, it paid off. But finding mispriced bets is kind of the, I think that's kind of how your mind has to think, you know, J rather than just responding to you know, a, a widely marketed opportunity that everyone's looking at, we try to find ourselves looking at something that no one's looking at at the time, if that makes sense. We have time for one more question. So I'm Vinny Smith, and I was wondering what problems are you facing with the city and the county and the state and what do they all want out of the inland port? Do you have another hour? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a really good question and honestly it's like above our political pay grade because we're not, poli I, I've learned that I'm not a politician and I don't want to be a politician. That's basically what I've learned. But I think Travis said it best, it generally just comes down to everybody wanting the same thing in the end. But, but also wanting the political control over what that is. I don't think anyone argues about the merits of what this could do for the region and how important it could be and what, why there's a reason to do it. I just think that... It's about power and control. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's about power and control. The city wants it, the county want it, and the state want it. Look at the Salt Lake Airport. Who controls the Salt Lake Airport? It's the Salt Lake Airport Authority, Salt Lake City. So you have the state, the county, and the city fighting over the power and the control and who gets to you know, say how and what and why things happen instead of we should just do the right things for the right reasons. And, and so our role is really kind of trying to take everybody, bring them together and help them see the value in, in, in all of it and how, how everyone can win in, in creating a, a solution 
um, for a long-term vision for the state with the growth and with all the environmental issues and everything that we confront, it's a very compelling, it's a very compelling, you know, case study. Great. Hey, thank you so much. Um, listen, you may have heard some terminology you're not familiar with. Uh, that's why we have real estate classes. We have uh, tools in place to get you ready to be in, in a seat like these guys are in uh, doing these types of jobs. Uh, this has been fantastic in terms of seeing specific projects, uh, hearing about what goes on in the mind of a developer and all their challenges and their interactions with the city and with the governments and, and whatnot. So uh, let's give them a big round of applause for it.